Viral replication cycles. So generally, viruses follow this series of steps in order to replicate themselves. The very first step is to attach to the cell that it wants to infect. So we're just gonna be looking at this little schematic with influenza. This is the influenza virus particle right here. And first step is to attach to the cell. So here's the cell. This could be an epithelial cell that's in your, in your nose or in your airways. Um, it's a cell that's going to become infected with influenza. So you can see very first thing here, um, some of the glycoproteins on the virus are binding to a receptor protein on the cell. So there's some sort of a recognition, some sort of a binding that can happen. And once that takes place, the influenza virus particle manages to get inside of the cell. So you can see it's starting to sort of bud inwards right here. Sometimes just this binding is enough to trigger endocytosis by the cell. So the virus particle gets taken inside. Here we are over here. Endocytosis has happened. Now it's inside. And then the next step is for the virus particle to sort of get unwrapped. And so there are all these layers we talked about. Those have to be disassembled in order to free the genome, which has the instructions for making viral proteins. Uh, so down here, we've got what's called uncoating taking place. Um, the virus particle essentially comes apart and the genome is then available. In the case of influenza, the genome is RNA. So what can happen is that RNA just gets expressed, it gets translated by a ribosome, right? Remember, mRNA heads over to a ribosome generally inside of cells, and then protein gets made from it. So that's what takes place here. The genome gets read by one of the host cell's ribosomes, and then the cell starts building viral proteins as a result. The cell doesn't know anything is, is sort of unusual at this point, it's just doing what cells do, right? Um, building protein based on what, what instructions it has in mRNA. So all these viral proteins start to accumulate and they self-assemble. They stick together in a very particular pattern and they start grouping up. And essentially what this is doing is building new little bits of, of new virus particles. Okay, so once all the new pieces are generated, um, they self-assemble and this new virus particle is ready to leave the cell and go and infect another cell. So this infection is going to spread. The virus particles will leave the cell and head off and find another one to infect. Could be another cell within the same person, or it could be a cell inside of a different person, right? Viruses can, can spread. A lot of times the spread of viruses is tied to the symptoms that they cause. So in the case of cold viruses, um, a lot of times they end up causing symptoms of things like coughing and sneezing. And what that does is it, it puts the virus particles out into the air and then potentially another person might breathe them in, um, get them inside of their mouth somehow, and become infected that way. So that brings us to that brings us to considering how um, viruses can enter the body. Okay, so it turns out there are only really a few specific ways that viruses can gain entry to our bodies. And this is kind of good news. It's, it's a handy thing to know. Okay, generally viruses enter through a wet site, a site that has maybe a mucous membrane, somewhere like your mouth, right? It's wet in there. There's a mucous membrane that lines it. That's an easy place for a virus to gain entry. Most viruses cannot enter directly through your skin. Your skin is a really good barrier, really good protective barrier. Um, it doesn't really matter if you go and touch a dirty doorknob, right, with your hand. As long as you don't have a cut or anything, your skin is going to do a great job of keeping the virus particles out of your body. They'll just be on the surface of your hand. So then um, what you would want to do is be careful not to touch your face. Your face has a lot of mucous membranes. Don't touch your nose, your eyes, or your mouth um, because that's where the viruses could gain entry into your body. So if you're out and about touching a dirty doorknob, um, just be sure that you wash your hands with soap and water and that'll flush the virus particles away without ever actually infecting you. All right, so sites in the body where viruses can enter. Um, definitely the head is an area where, where um, for example, cold viruses tend to gain entry. Okay, so the nose, the mouth, um, the eyes, those are all wet sites. 
where they can gain entry. But there are also some other places in the body. If you have a scratch or some sort of an injury, that's kind of exposing some wet surfaces. So then that's a potential site of infection. Um, using needles, needles uh, can carry things directly into the bloodstream uh, from outside. So that's how some diseases can be transmitted through, through needle use. Um, so kind of going along with that same concept, bringing things inside of the body, some arthropods, some insects can actually transmit diseases this way. Um, some diseases can be transmitted through mosquitoes just by getting a mosquito bite. Finally, sexually transmitted diseases can be transmitted um, through the mucous membranes in this region of the body. And this is something where um, another useful thing to know, condoms do help prevent sexually transmitted diseases, but they don't bring the risk to zero. And that's because there is still some contact of mucous membranes, even with a condom in place. Once viruses do gain entry into the body, there are a lot of different diseases that they can cause, just depending on which type of virus it was that gained entry. So lots of different examples of viral diseases here uh, from our textbook. Some of these are kind of interesting because some of them, some of these diseases can be caused by either viruses or by bacteria. So for example, pneumonia, there's viral pneumonia and then there's also bacterial pneumonia and they cause very similar symptoms. Also meningitis would be another example. It's an inflammation of the coverings on the, the brain and the spinal cord that can be caused by either viruses or bacteria. And so sometimes uh, if a doctor isn't sure what the cause is, they might prescribe um, an antibiotic, which is something that kills bacteria, but it doesn't kill viruses. So sometimes it's a, there's a little bit of trial and error, right? If they prescribe an antibiotic, but then the person doesn't get better, then they might suspect, oh, it's actually, it's actually a viral infection and we might need to treat the symptoms differently. And with regards to recovering from infections, viral infections in particular, some viral infections are permanent. Even today, some of them we don't have a way to get rid of the infection once it has happened. And this is why it's so important to be aware of how viruses can enter the body so that you have some control over this fact. We don't want to be getting viral infections um, unnecessarily, so it's good to know how, how these diseases can be transmitted. Um, let's talk about some treatments that are available. So we have vaccines that allow us to prevent certain infections. And then we do also have antivirals that help us to treat certain infections. And then there are other infections that we don't have treatments for. So there's kind of the whole spectrum here. Let's just take a look. So vaccines, vaccines are primarily for preventing an infection from ever happening. So that's like, that's ideal, right? We want to just prevent it from ever happening in the first place, not try and deal with it after the fact. There are a few different types of vaccines available. Um, some vaccines are literally just weakened live viruses. So what they do is they take a sample of a virus and then they grow it in the lab and um, induce some mutations in the virus so that it's not as strong as it used to be. And that way, if they take that weakened virus and infect somebody with it, um, what, what happens then is the person gets infected, but they don't actually develop any disease symptoms. It's a really, really weak virus, so their body is just able to sort of deal with it without ever manifesting disease symptoms. That's not a real common method of vaccination. Hey, most vaccines are one of these other types. Killed viruses, these are inactivated viruses. They're not able to reproduce anymore, but they still have the same general structure. And so by introducing them into the body, it shows our immune system what the virus looks like and the immune system builds antibodies against it um, so that our bodies are prepared for a future exposure if that were ever to happen. There are other vaccines that are just based on subunits of viruses. So for example, taking, taking a little piece of the capsid and introducing that into the body. And so there's not even any genome present in that case. It's just a little bit of protein that gets introduced into the body. And then again, our immune system gets to see that protein and learn how to fight it so that the immune system is prepared for the next time that person is exposed to it. A new type of, of vaccine is the mRNA vaccine. This is the type of vaccine that is available for um, COVID-19 for preventing 
um, the, the disease caused by SARS-CoV-2. And with an mRNA vaccine, all it is really is just a little piece of mRNA. And in the case of coronavirus, what the mRNA encodes is one of the spike proteins, one of the proteins that sticks out of the virus. So what I have over here, this is a schematic of the virus, SARS-CoV-2. This is the virus that causes COVID-19. And if you look at the structure of this virus, it has an RNA genome, and then it, it is actually an enveloped virus. So here's its envelope in light blue, and we've got um, these proteins sticking out. These are called spike proteins. By the way, the reason coronaviruses are called coronaviruses, if you didn't know already, um, corona means crown, and these are viruses that have very decorative proteins sticking out. It kind of looks like they have a crown. So these are called coronaviruses. This is the whole family of viruses, and SARS-CoV-2 is one, one member in that family. Um, coronaviruses are RNA-based viruses. Their genome is made of RNA, and RNA tends to mutate a little bit more quickly than DNA. From one generation to the next, there are just mistakes that get introduced when the genome is replicated. And so this is why sometimes new variants arise and sometimes vaccines have to be redesigned in order to address those new variants. Um, so anyway, the, the coming back to, to the vaccines, the mRNA vaccines that are available right now for the coronavirus, what they do is they encode the spike protein. And when this vaccine gets in the body, what happens is our cells actually um, interpret this mRNA. They start building these spike proteins and then the immune system sees, oh, this looks like a foreign protein. I better design some antibodies against it so that I'm ready to, to treat this infection. Um, and that way, in the future, if we are exposed to the coronavirus, our immune system is able to fight it like right away. There's no, there's no lag time. And so our immune systems generally can deal with it before any symptoms even develop. Okay, um, let's switch gears here a little bit. Antivirals, this is another type of, of treatment um, that's available against, against viruses. And with antivirals, essentially what happens is the infection has already taken place. Okay, so the virus, unfortunately, is already inside of our cells. But what the antiviral can do is help to slow down the replication process of that virus. So um, there are lots of different varieties of antivirals, but generally what they all do is they block some of the viral proteins from being able to function. So maybe the virus isn't able to complete its replication. Um, maybe it's not able to uncoat. So in some way, the virus gets interrupted and that helps to stop the infection from spreading. It doesn't actually get rid of the virus altogether in most cases. So for example, herpes. Herpes viruses cause cold sores and they also cause genital sores, genital herpes. Um, and acyclovir is an antiviral drug that's available to help with that infection. Um, herpes though, herpes is a virus that lives in our nerve cells and nerve cells don't die off and get replaced. They're there for the long term. So once the virus is inside of the nerve cell, it's just kind of stuck there, unfortunately. There's no way to completely get rid of it. So acyclovir, this can help to prevent flare-ups. It can help to prevent a person from spreading herpes to somebody else, um, but it doesn't actually ever rid the person of herpes, unfortunately. Tamiflu is an antiviral that's available for treating flu. But um, again, this is kind of, so it's helpful. It helps to reduce how long the person will be sick with the flu, but it doesn't actually prevent symptoms. It doesn't actually get rid of the flu altogether. It just kind of has to run its course. And by the way, um, just to, I don't want to leave confusion, too much confusion, hopefully. Um, okay, so some viruses are permanent. Some viral infections are permanent. Not all viral infections are permanent. A lot of colds and flu viruses, our bodies are able to completely get rid of them. It just takes a, like a week or two in order for that process to happen. So anyway, Tamiflu helps to reduce the time span of the infection. We mentioned HIV earlier. This is the virus that causes AIDS. And to treat this infection, there is a treatment called HART, H-A-A-R-T. This is, stands for Highly Active Antiretroviral Therapy. It's 
kind of a long, long name there. It's a drug cocktail. It's a mixture of, of several different antivirals. And the reason for this is because HIV is a virus that mutates very quickly. So if we tried to treat it with just one antiviral, chances are that the virus would develop a resistance to that antiviral. It would be able to evade the drug. But if we provide a mixture of several different antiviral types, then that can help to interrupt the virus at various stages of replication. So resistance is less likely to develop in that case. Um, people who are infected with HIV, they have to be very consistent with taking their, their therapy, the heart therapy, in order for it to be effective. Otherwise, resistance is likely to develop. So given that our antivirals are limited, right? You can see there are some limitations here with, with treatment options. Um, again, the, the most ideal scenario is to just prevent infection altogether, which brings us back to vaccines. When did we start doing vaccinations kind of routinely? Well, if we go back to the 1950s, this was a time when polio was a real concern. The polio virus can cause uh, muscle paralysis, complete paralysis in children and it's permanent. So this is something that was a real concern and um, this is really when vaccination efforts started to get underway. It was in, in the 1950s. They were using killed viruses to, to um, vaccinate against polio and then also live viruses were used um, I think more in the 1960s. And eventually this nearly eradicated polio. I wish I could say it was completely eradicated but not quite yet. Um, and that process of learning how to vaccinate against polio, that really helped to pave the way for routine vaccinations of other things, things like measles, mumps, and rubella. The MMR vaccine is a vaccine that's routine, routinely given for um, preventing those diseases. And um, as long as a large fraction of our society gets these vaccines, they're very effective. If we don't have a large fraction of the society getting the vaccines, then what can happen is the disease starts spreading, right, amongst people who are not vaccinated, and as it spreads, it starts to mutate. And what does that mean? That means that the people who are vaccinated might suddenly become at risk again, right? Because the disease has changed. And so then it might eventually be able to spread into the vaccinated population as well. So it's really important with vaccines, um, if they are going to work and if they are going to be effective at preventing disease, it really has to be a mass effort. It has to be in large part society as a whole working together and agreeing to vaccinations in order to prevent disease spread from happening. I would like to end with one other consideration here. This is something our textbook doesn't get into a whole lot. I'm pulling some information from other sources. Um, but just this consideration, are all viruses bad? So right now, for sure, viruses are getting a bad rap and for good reason, right? They, they can cause really serious diseases and we don't want those diseases to happen. But it's worth asking, are all viruses causing disease? It turns out not. Uh, some viruses are actually really beneficial to have around. Chances are we would be in a lot of trouble if all, vac if all viruses were suddenly gone. So I just want to give an example of that here. Some viruses actually help prevent disease. So the example that's on the slide is showing a virus. Um, this is called a BAM community, B-A-M. The BAM community helps to prevent infections with bacteria. So what we're looking at down here, this is a layer of epithelial cells that are secreting mucus. These are cells that are in our large intestine. And stuck in this mucus layer, are actually viruses. These are bacteriophage. They just kind of hang out in the mucus layer. They are not causing any problems for us, but rather what they are doing is hanging out and waiting until a bacterial cell comes by that's not supposed to be there. And um, that bacterial cell will be attacked by these viruses. So what have the viruses done? They've just saved us from a bacterial infection. So kind of an interesting thing there. It's good for us um, to have these viruses present. 
So on that note, there are definitely other examples of beneficial viruses as well, uh, but that's getting into a little bit more depth than, than our course is designed to address. Um, so that's where we're going to call it a day on this section. And next up, we'll be getting into the immune response a little bit more. How do our immune systems respond to infections?